Welcome to Uppsala University and to Uptook Weekly. My name is Lina Sors Emilsson. I'm your host today together with Karin Pellenberg. Hello. And our guest today is Lars Ostreiser, Associate Professor at the Department of Information and Technology. During the next 30 minutes until 12.30, Lars and I will talk about computer brain interface. Uptalk Weekly is a popular science seminar and it's part of the Faculty for Science and Technology's online education initiative, which is for alumni and anyone interested out there in society. One of the main goals with this seminar is to provide you as participant the opportunity to talk and interact with our researchers. So please ask questions whenever all through the seminar and I will bring them in to the discussion with Lars. Ask your questions through the chat function. And please remember to keep your phones, your camera and your microphones off. And I also like to note that this seminar is recorded. Hello Lars, welcome to Uptalk Weekly. Hello, thank you very much for having me here. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Lars, before okay, we get so going. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm associate professor at the IT department uh, at the uh, unit for visual interaction and uh, uh, information. And uh, I'm working, uh, I started my work with here with, uh, uh, with um, research into human computer interaction. Uh, my first background is as a computer scientist, so I'm a hardcore programmer uh, from the start. Uh, but I have uh, more and more come over to the software side of computation uh, about okay. users, how to actually work with users. And uh, in the recent years, uh, I have started to work a little bit with the robots and uh, their support for people with uh, uh, disabilities or impairments. And in the latest years, I've actually gone over to work with uh, very impaired uh, children. Uh, and we'll probably talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and I have left the robotics field uh, behind a little bit here. So how come you made this transition from you know, basic computer science into working with people who are having different, different um, challenges of participating in the society using this kind of technologies, the brain computer interface robots that we will talk about today? Uh, it's a, it's a long story, but it really started already to my, my basic education where I got contact with a psychologist uh, who had problems understanding with the computer scientists. So she asked me to help her to interpret the lingo. And while doing that, I got more and more interested in to see how we could, uh, well, help users to understand the, the magic of computers inside. Uh, and the uh, this uh, field of research has, has eventually brought me into uh, thinking about uh, people who are even uh, have even smaller capabilities uh, when it comes to interaction. Uh, most of the one the people I work with today have very limited uh, uh, both uh, motor and, and uh, sometimes even perceptual uh, uh, capabilities. And so uh, it's really a very uh, sort of important field for me to work with. Them. So, so what is the drive? Why is this an important field for you to work with? Uh, I would say the, the most important thing for me is, is uh, to see if we can bring the, the, the big research area now about uh, human brain computer interaction uh, into uh, something that would be useful for uh, a group of, of, of people who actually need these kind of, of uh, devices. Okay, so let us go in in a little bit more detail and start, like set the foundation. Can you please tell us what actually is brain computer interface? What are you, what, what are we talking about when we talk about what we shorten it BCI? What, what is it? It's uh, essentially a, a um, way for uh, the computer to um, see, uh, to, to try to understand what, what the person tries to do. So I'm going to share a picture here, uh, which is, I mean, just giving you a, a rough idea about what happens. We have a lot of um, 
sort of uh, signals going on in our brain and, and we use the brain without thinking about it. Sometimes when we talk about research here, we actually, I differentiate between what you do and what your brain does. Because uh, when it comes to brain computer interfaces, it's something completely different. Uh, it could be that you want to do something, but to get your brain to do that without having the muscles to control is, is a completely different uh, thing. It's a little bit like learning how to ride a bicycle to keep the balance. Nobody can really tell you how to do it, but you have to grasp it with your reflexes and your neural path. So, so if, yeah. yeah, sorry. No, please. <laughs> yeah, so if you, if you take the picture here, you have a, a person who's trying to think and we try to use a computer to, to, uh, to understand or to uh, interpret the uh, signals and then transfer it to something that could be useful for the person. In this case, I've just chosen to use a robotic arm. And uh, one way we could use this could be, for instance, to have this robotic arm replace the real arm uh, in case we have a person who has uh, paralysis in, in the arms or, or so. So we can use this quite, it's quite often used to control um, prosthetic limbs. Um, although it's, most of the time we actually use it uh, attached to uh, neurons that are remain in the arms or the, the, the muscles that, that still react to, to the brain uh, signals. So if we leave the picture, um, we can see you again. <laughs> so, um, so basically, there are differences between when it comes to brain-computer interface, we're actually reading brain nerve cell activity. And when we have prosthetics, we're reading the signals from the brain that have reached the, the neurons in the arm. Yeah, that's, I mean, simply put, yes. There are, of course, people who try to do the, the go, go further. Uh, yeah. Where you have, for instance, a paralysis that comes in, in the uh, um, uh, vertebrae, uh, uh, the, the, the spine, high up in the spine, there are no signals coming from the uh, muscles anymore. So in that case, we need to go further. But it's very difficult to get those uh, um, interfaces to work. Okay. So if we go into the brain-computer interface, uh, how does it work? What kind of different methods do we have today? And how do we actually read these signals? There are uh, quite a few different methods we can use. Uh, the most common one, I think, is the uh, um, electroencephalogram, which is uh, shortly described EEG. And uh, a lot of people who have had uh, head injuries or, or uh, being um, fainting or so, or having, have, having epileptic, epileptic seizures, recognize that. Um, so what we can do is to, to, in that case, read the electrical currents in, in the brain. So uh, if you take this uh, picture here, uh, I just listed a few of the most important uh, ways to, to read uh, information. Uh, if you talk about information as being just signals or levels of signals, uh, EEG is the one that is most uh, common and it's also a, a more precise technology called magnetoencephalography. Uh, both of those are uh, very, um, are, are, I would say, quite rough because they are just measuring the surface uh, signals. Uh, there are uh, methods that have been developed that could actually make it more invasive, which means that you actually operate uh, electrodes into uh, the brain at different places. Uh, if you heard about uh, Elon Musk's uh, work, he's doing exactly that with uh, nanotechnology uh, chips. Uh, on the other side, it's also something called CT or CAT scan, which is uh, tomography uh, uh, based on, on uh, different kinds of, of uh, radiation uh, x-rays or so. Uh, and of course, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, where you are sort of pulled through a tunnel uh, and there's also a version of that which is called functional magnetic resonance imaging, which means that you try to find, um, to say, differences in, in activity in the brain using magnetic resonance imaging. Okay. Uh, the problem with those three last ones is that they are require quite large instruments. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about tons and uh, quite he heavy expenses. Uh, they are actually uh, in, in a room by its own. They are so yes. big that they kind of fill a whole room. So yeah. Yes. 
So uh, if you think about that as a tool for communication for people with uh, disabilities, that's not really practical. I mean, that that's, doesn't, doesn't work that way. And the same, the same is the problem actually with the magnetic encephalography, which is both expensive and also uh, requires uh, some very complex uh, machinery. For our listeners who's never seen an EEG, which is the one I know that you're working a lot with, can, do you have something to visualize how it actually looks so, you, so our listeners can get a picture of how it looks? Yes. And I also so like I a... to, to just uh, uh, let everyone who's listening know that your questions are more than welcome, so don't hold them back. Please, George. Picture. So... Uh... Let's see here if we can get the picture up. Uh, this is a, a, just a small idea about what it looks like when you, when you see it. I'm going to share the screen here so you can get that. Um, and uh, what you can see here is a very advanced uh, type of, of uh, headset. And it has a, a quite a large number of electrodes. Uh, most of these are, in this case, uh, wet electrodes, which means that they have to be added with some kind of gel or something like that, which makes it a mess, bit messy. Uh, and what gets out of that is a series of different kinds of, of uh, graphs. Uh, often you take that for each uh, electrode, but you could also find out something called brain waves, if you, uh, you recognize. We talk about alpha waves, beta waves, and so on. Um, the brain waves are, in some way, interpreted so that we can get some idea about what's in, uh, what they re represent. So if you've heard of someone who can uh, detect that you uh, are falling asleep, for instance, they often look at uh, some, of the, the alpha, some of the brain waves that are indicators of that you're getting tired or relaxed. And so. So, so this is the kind of technology you have been using in the project you are running, or, or how does the devices look that you use? I know you have some, some with you there also. Yes, uh, the, the, the general idea that, we have, that I've been working with is to see if you can actually work with uh, simple measures and try to see how far can you get with devices that you can very easily fit onto, onto a person's head. So um, I'll take this first one. This is a... Uh, one channel device, which is actually the one I have on the picture uh, at the presentation here. So this is a one channel device and it can read, uh, it reads the uh, activity in my forehead. So it's a very limited type of, of uh, uh, device. Uh, however, we have been using this for the music project that we talked about, trying to see if we can in some way affect uh, a synthesizer by to play different kind of notes. Uh, by using brain waves. So, um, so please tell us a little yeah. bit about that that project you are mentioning, where you are using this device to read one channel of of children who have a severe mm -hmm. impairment, to to enable them to play music, and they can actually not move their arms and legs, as I understood. No, these children that we have had contact with, the, the, the general project was uh, at the special special training school where you have children with very severe impairments. Uh, they need help with everything. And the idea we had was that we would be able to make people, uh, make the children play music on their own without any help of, of uh, teachers or assistants or so. And to do that, we added a lot of different kinds of instruments. Uh, however, all those required that you could move your muscles. So in the end, we tried to create a medic med uh, musical instrument that could be uh, driven by uh, the results of using this kind of band. Uh, unfortunately, that was a bit too, would you say, a bit too uh, difficult because either, uh, one, one part is this is a very rough uh, type of instrument, but also because of music is very complex in its nature. So in the end, what we did was to take away the music and add it as a game instead, where they could play a, a small game of, of moving uh, uh, small, uh, things on the screen to see if they could uh, affect the things on, on the screen with this device. So how does that actually work? So they can play, what can they do? Can they do what we do when we play Nintendo and, and mm -hmm. like move, do left, right, up, down, uh, go around? You know, how does it work when you can, how, 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 how advanced a kind of, of 
regulation can you have into the game with this device? Uh, you can, I mean, there is, there are actually now uh, competitions about game, gaming with the brain technology like this. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it sometimes seems that we can do more than we actually can do. And I'm sometimes a bit of a techno skeptic, uh, thinking about that we should be very careful about uh, thinking about how uh, people will uh, use this technology. Uh, or actually, how do you describe what they can do and cannot do? Uh, what these children could do was they could select uh, a, a red or a green ball and make that jump uh, uh, according to the red. And this was done using something called biofeedback, uh, which means that the brain had to learn which action was the best one. Uh, and thus, it was a, it's very difficult to tell someone how to do it. Uh, but it, did actually work to some extent, uh, and uh, we, I'm currently trying to develop this a little bit more so we can see if it's possible to actually get more accurate uh, difference. So, but, what, yeah. what impact does this have for, for, for children and people today? Uh, what I, this what technology. I'm working, yeah, what I'm working with is to try to, this, the, the, the ultimate goal would of course be to be something that could be used to communicate. Uh, to be able to uh, help someone to, to get out. Uh, I have to, to show my, my, this is my, this was supposed to be my, my uh, final slide, but I'm going to show you the, the idea that I have about where this can lead in the end, uh, which is, I think, very far away in the future still. Um, what I would like to have happening is that we could actually find these uh, children who, who, uh, uh, are in some kind of locked in syndrome state and help them pound through the wall uh, into uh, the same world as we live in. Uh, and that is, that, that can be done with many different techniques, uh, but it, some of these techniques actually require that you could actually manipulate your muscles in some way. For instance, we have uh, eye tracking technology. Uh, with this technology, we are able to actually to directly access. Uh, these people's thoughts, or not thoughts really, but the reactions that they can, can, can provide. It's a, it's a beautiful picture. Uh, it really shows, you know, we have this uh, situation where what we call a locked in syndrome, where people can't reach out. So if, if we move away from the picture so we can see you again, <laughs> I, would like, I would like to know a little bit about what actually is possible today then. How far have we come with this technology? Can we read thoughts? Can't we read thoughts? And so there's actually quite a lot of, of work that has been done with these kind of things. Uh, we can, to some extent, it depends a little bit on which technology you use. Uh, if we use those more, uh, I would say, heavy uh, technologies, we can actually do quite a lot of, of, of uh, functional uh, mapping of the brain. Um, most of us, uh, if we read in psychology or, or, or biology, we, we get to know that there is a visual center in the back of the brain, for instance. So if you hit someone in the back of the head, they will might lose their, their eyesight. Uh, we could also know that there are some places which are uh, sort of very important for language understanding, uh, especially spoken language and so on. Uh, but you can also find that there are certain ways of, of uh, looking at, at uh, the, the, the uh, patterns that are in the in the brain, and in some cases we have actually uh, we I can't say we uh, there has been uh, studies which try to find, uh, for instance, uh, which picture a person is looking at by checking the stimulation of the visual uh, part of the brain. Um, the, 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 it's very tempting to say that we are thought reading, but that's definitely not possible today. And we can be quite assured that this is not going to be happening for quite some time, I think. Uh, it's, it's really, a, a, I would say, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a scenario which I don't, I, I, I hope and I, I believe that we will never get there uh, because uh, that would give very big issues with privacy. Okay. And, and integrity. So, why is it so hard? Why do you say that, you know, 
it, it, I don't know if we will get there. Why is, so, is it so hard to read these signals and, and have like a mind map of, of knowing what a person thinks? What, what is the biggest challenge to be able to do this? I think it is a matter of scale in some way. Um, we have a brain uh, which is approximately a little bit more than a kilo uh, of, of uh, mass. Uh, it's a gray or a white mass that you, you sort of doesn't look very much for the eye. Uh, for a grown up person, that mass contains 100 billion neurons. And, and that's even, uh, that's an amount which is, you can't really count them over a person's lifetime if you would count them one by one. And to even make it worse, each neuron has about 1,000 connections to other neurons. Which means that overall, you know, in a, in a grown-up person's uh, brain, there are 100 trillion connections uh, that can have different kinds of states. And unlike the computers we have uh, at our disposal, uh, the brain is not digital. It's very much analog, which adds to the complexity of the system. In, in, in the, so what so, do you mean with being analog for someone who's not into ah, the <laughs> Sorry. Uh, analog means that uh, we have, uh, it, there is no ticking clock or there is enough anything that will guide the, 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 the thinking. It happens as fast as it can and that's the, the main point of, of, of the thinking. Whereas a computer uh, counts in ones and zeros and has a certain clock that we de uh, define how, how fast we, we can compute. So basically every, every individual's brain is unique and every way they think and create association to what they have experienced before is unique. You could say that. I mean, the, the, the brains, the brain, the neurons have been connecting to each other over by practicing and by, by learning over a long time. And uh, it, it actually has done so already from the start. As the first nerve cells start to form in the embryo, they have started connecting. And people have different experiences in different periods of time, and they come in different uh, sort of orders and so on. So the more I read about this, or the more I, I do the research about this, it's uh, more and more, uh, I would say, surprising that we can actually communicate with each other at all, having sort of similar uh, ideas uh, together. So that's, and a shared uh, vision of, of things. Yeah, and not, not even without, not even when you communicate with the brains, but actually communicate by a translation of the sound. So if we go back to the, the BCI, the brain computer interface technology, uh, what, what do you envision? How, what, what do you see will happen in the future? What kind of technologies? Will we have one or can we have several of these black <laughs> in, that will give more signals? Where, where are we going? Are they going to be invasive, non-invasive? Where invasive is that we have operated in an electrode reading the electrical signals in the brain or a device as you have on your head now. So where do you think we are moving for something that will be useful for, for individuals in the society? I, I think the technology can be very useful for quite a lot of uh, things actually. So that, that's, I'm, I'm not against using technology for, for supporting the human being, uh, but I think it, actually has one of the biggest, uh, I'll say, uh, benefits for people with uh, uh, different kind of, of, of severe disorder, that is impairments, uh, because uh, we can do so much already. And if we continue the research, we might probably do much more. Um, and, and what will we do that is much more? What do you think, think we, we will can, be do? I think we can get more uh, supportive technology for, for uh, replacement of limb movements, for instance, or, or different kind of processes. Uh, I can envision that we can have other kinds of, of uh, uh, perceptual uh, uh, help, like when you have a bad hearing, you might be able to hear despite not, not having the, 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 the functioning ear in some cases. Uh, but I also can see that, that uh, for these, this group with lock-in syndrome, that it would be a very big thing to actually just be able to say yes or no. Mm. Uh, and if you can get even further, that would be even, even more interesting. Uh, and 
I think that if we have, with, with the as I say, advanced technologies, we can actually get go very far uh, in, in, in this direction. Uh, the, the problem, I think, is that we might end up in, in uh, places where we have equipment that costs uh, hundreds of thousands of crowns uh, in order to help a person, which might not be feasible in the long run. So my hope is that we can actually try to find out where the limit is for what we can uh, read from the brain uh, and uh, the, the, uh, still using very sort of simple technologies. I, I don't uh, think we should underestimate the ability to be able to say yes and no. That, that's the that is, ability, I think. Yeah. It's, yeah. And, and it will have an enormous impact on people's lives who can't do that today. So, uh, I, I just say that I also think that this invasive technology will have its uh, uses. Uh, my only, uh, I would say, uh, problem with that is that uh, it's not very easy to take it off. Once it's there, it's there which means that we have no control over it anymore. Yeah. Whereas if we have a headset uh, that reads your uh, thoughts, if you say that that way, uh, it, it, it's very easy to remove it. Uh, so basically having a chip to... in your brain, as yes. Elon Musk is, is made, it will make it a risk for your integrity, that you get hacked, that you can have people interacting with you without your will. Yes, and it so, might sound like science fiction today, but, but uh, I think uh, we don't really know what we can do with these kind of technologies. And that mm -hmm. is my fear, I would say with this. If we have both the idea that it's good, it's a good side to which we can help people, and there's a bad side to it that we can actually do things which might in, mm -hmm. actually really disturb the integrity and the, the, the personal spheres. So very shortly, we are, Having two more minutes in this seminar, um, what is your dream project? What, what is in your lab and what your team and what you are working with, what is your dream, dream um, project today? Uh, that, that's, that's the one I'm working with. <laughs> which is? Uh, we're trying to use this kind of, of helmet here, which is the most, uh, sort of the biggest device we're using. And it has some 16 electrodes, which is about what we can manage with simple technology. And uh, it, does show some interesting possibilities to actually reach towards this this mm. idea. But uh, I would like to be able to do that, uh, and I would even love to be there ten years from now uh, to see what what will happen if that we actually can get there somewhere. We have a question here from David. He asks, "Can you see a future where the fMRI, which is one of these very large technologies today that mm -hmm. takes a whole room?" Uh, of accuracy can be found in a ver ver variable technology that you can have on you? Mm. I, I'm, I'm not a specialist on the fMRI technology uh, myself, so I, 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 I assume that at some point you will be able to do it. In, in a way, I think that depends a little bit on the technology of magnets, uh, the strength of the magnets, because this technology really needs very strong magnetic fields. Uh, however, that also means that <laughs> if you go out in public, uh, you might have to be careful who you're close to because you might be suspected of stealing things from people with a magnet when it starts running your, your thing. So shielding in that case would also be very important. Yeah. Uh, generally, I don't think that if, uh, uh, fMRI could be very good uh, for people who are very seriously uh, in, uh, impaired. Uh, okay. And if they can actually sort of come to the, per to, to the hospital to actually start this kind of communication, that would work. And with that, we are going to close this seminar today. Uh, time flies. Every uptalk weekly we have really on the five minutes. So thank you, Lars, for taking time and, and sharing your knowledge and your experience and your thoughts around brain-computer interface. We also like to thank all the listeners who's joined us today and for coming in with a question. And also a big thank you to all our colleagues here at Uppsala University, specifically to my co-host Karin and to the Department of um, uh, Unit of Communication and Outreach and Professor Mikael Jonsson at Uptech, who is part of planning these up talks. Next Tuesday, Karin will be host and uh, this seminar 
and our guest will be uh, Valentin Troll. He is professor at the Department of Earth Sciences, Natural Resources and Sustainable Development. Karin and Val will talk about the two phases of volcanoes, the entrance to hell, as well as a provider of a large amount of resources that shape our daily lives and without which we would not exist in the way we are today. So till next week and have a good Tuesday. Bye.